They had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. It's clear from the story that we read that the disappointment and trauma that these disciples have just experienced are the realest things to them when they meet this mysterious fellow traveler. They're talking about it. They're talking about this trauma, this disappointment that they've gone through. What doesn't seem to be real to them is this strange news that the women had reported to them this morning. The tomb was empty. That Jesus' body was not there. And a messenger had told these women that Jesus was alive. It seems pretty clear from the story that Cleopas and his friend don't believe this to be true yet. They think it's strange. And we don't know why exactly they were walking to Emmaus that morning, but it seems like maybe they were trying to get away, trying to walk far away from this complex, disappointing, dangerous business of what had happened in Jerusalem over those past days. They were walking away from the death from the rumors of life, from the chance of believing in such a strange new hope, and maybe again being disappointed. I think they just wanted to get away from it all. I'm not sure what tone their conversation would have taken as they walked. Maybe they were crying, remember the, remembering the awfulness of the cross. Maybe they were remembering the betrayals and the actions of Judas, of Pilate, or the Roman guards who mocked Jesus. Maybe their anger at those things was moving toward bitterness and cynicism. Maybe they were chiding themselves for being foolish enough to hope in the redemption that Jesus had seemed to promise. A kingdom of justice, of peace, free from oppression, full of healing. They had hoped that Jesus would be the one to redeem Israel. Maybe they felt silly for believing that. Maybe they were irritated, questioning the reliability of the women who had visited the tomb and brought back impossible news. But wherever they were in that conversation on the road, expressing the disappointment or anger or belief, it's at that moment, it's at that moment that Jesus approaches them. Jesus doesn't approach them after they've already come around to believing in the resurrection. Jesus doesn't come to them when they finally manage to find the silver lining or five points of gratitude in all of this. Jesus doesn't come to them when they've figured out where this horrible weekend fit into their story in a meaningful way. Jesus comes to them when they are angry, and disappointed, and confused, and uncharitable. And Jesus, this mysterious traveler, when he comes to them, first of all, just listens to their whole long, confused story. And then Jesus invites them back into a bigger story, into the story they were already a part of, the story of Moses and prophets, the people of God, story told in the scriptures that had been pa passed down to them. As they described it later, on that walk toward Emmaus, Jesus opened the scriptures to them during that conversation. Jesus helped them to see where their story fit within the longer story of God with God's people. The story of God's faithfulness. The story of a God of life. A God who cares for the vulnerable of God who will do anything to join God's people. Jesus invites them on this journey back into the process that he had led them in as a teacher, the process of wrestling with the word, the scriptures, the story of their faith, and finding themselves in their current journey within that story. That process of, of wrestling with the word is not a clear or an easy process generally. But it's the process that we have. Through time, God 
has always been revealed in the stories of our faith that have been passed down to us. And in our process of reading those stories, reading the word, remembering the stories, discussing them, even arguing over them together. The disciples participated in that on the road with Jesus, and we participate in it too. Through those stories, we come to know God. I think we come to know God even, or maybe especially even, when we come to those stories and bring our anger and our disappointment and confusion, ready to wrestle, ready to bring what is true and what is difficult. And what I love about this story is that Cleopas and the other disciples don't get all the way to understanding. Even with Jesus himself, they're explaining the scriptures to them. They don't quite get it before they get to Emmaus. But they seem to have sensed either that something important was happening, or maybe they just fell back on their default instinct toward hospitality. And so they invited this mysterious fellow traveler to stay with them and eat with them that night. Without this invitation, it seems like Jesus might have just gone on. Jesus might have walked on ahead to another town. Jesus doesn't force himself or his message on them. He entered into conversation with them. He offered it with some enthusiasm and vigor, it seems like, believing it to be important. But Jesus doesn't force himself into their company. But because they invited Jesus to stay with them, they came to find that Jesus himself was the host at their table, blessing their bread, blessing their table in the midst of traveling. There's so much to this story. The road to Emmaus is one of the big stories of our faith, and there's much more to go into than I could in one morning. Perhaps a big obvious thing about this story is that it reminds us right now pretty emphatically of one of our big disappointments. That we can't be together, breaking bread, discovering Jesus in our midst in the physical embodied community. That's really terrible, it really sucks. In a lot of ways, reading the story this week is a big pile of unwelcome irony, I think. I really wish I was in a room with all of you, with our altar table set and ready for the great Thanksgiving, the great meal with Jesus. I wish I wasn't looking into a laptop in Miles' office with this bookcase behind me. The situation of COVID-19 is the worst. It's terrible. It's terrible that people are dying. It's terrible that so many are out of work and struggling. It's terrible that we're all stuck at home. Things that we'd planned to do in March and April and May and June were good things. And it's more than disappointing that we're not able to do them. I'm cynical and angry and disappointed about a lot of things in our world right now. And my guess is that many of you are too. And like Cleopas and the other disciples, it's okay to feel those things. And it's okay, I think it's even important to bring them to God and to each other without a tidy resolution already in place. We can be disappointed and angry. We don't have to try to make that okay. And yet, that is not the whole story. It's not the ending. I think this story of Emmaus, as hard as it is to read right now, invites us to see some contours of what else there might be for us on this strange journey. It invites us to see what Jesus might invite us to when we're ready. So for one thing, we don't have to pretend we're not angry and disappointed and struggling because that's when Jesus shows up. We don't have to put a shine on how hard this is so that God will love us and find us worthy. God loves us, Jesus loves us because Jesus loves us. We don't have to do anything to earn that. We don't have to be good enough or cheerful enough or strong enough to earn that. Jesus shows up with us because Jesus loves us. 
We don't have to do anything to earn the presence of Jesus in our midst either. We can be angry and disappointed and irritable and unpleasant and ungrateful, just like Cleopas and his friend what were on that journey, and Jesus will absolutely still love us and still show up and want to be with us. And the lovely thing about this story for us is that Jesus will not force his presence on us in our grief and confusion. Jesus will show up ready to join us in conversation and will have things to teach us. But Jesus doesn't force the disciples and won't force us to believe him or recognize this new resurrection life until we're ready. When they were ready, Jesus invited them to find meaning in the longer story of scripture. Jesus blessed them at the table. Jesus was ready to be recognized as the risen Christ, but only when they were ready to recognize him. And once that happened, once they recognized the risen Christ, they were ready to return to Jerusalem the sight of all that death and disappointment, the sight of this mysterious resurrection new life, and to join the rest of the disciples in moving forward in the light of the resurrection. I wonder if there might be an echo of that journey for us too. That when we're ready, Jesus is ready to help us find meaning, learning, blessing, and mission in the midst of this. It doesn't mean we have to erase or blot out what is hard or disappointing or impossible about this. But it does mean that Jesus is there with us, ready to guide us, ready to be with us. The resurrection doesn't invalidate or eliminate the pain and disappointment and anger and grief that we experience. The disciples weren't wrong to have hoped in a redemption for their people that looked sweeping or different than what happened. They weren't wrong to be crushed and traumatized by the awfulness of the crucifixion. We're not wrong to feel the anger, disappointment, or pain that we feel right now either. But when we're ready, Jesus is ready too to come alongside us on this journey. Jesus is able to invite us into resurrection life. It will probably be a different kind of type, different kind of life than we had hoped for exactly. It is the kind of life and light that exists alongside our pain and disappointment. The risen Christ still has the wounds of the cross. The resurrection doesn't make that go away. And the gift that we have at this time is that when we see and experience that new life, when Jesus appears in our midst in whatever surprising way he does, we can come together and share it with each other. For now, that will be over Zoom and email and phone and letter, which we're probably getting tired of. And our gatherings together focus more on the word than they do on bread and wine right now. But Jesus is the living word, the word made flesh who came to live among us. And I wonder whether this time might be an invitation to us as a community to discover the power of our long and sacred scripture story in a new way. We might invite Jesus to stay with us and help us understand our story, our scriptures better. To talk about those stories with Jesus and with each other. I know for me, even though at first I haven't really enjoyed being on Zoom for this worship, I've come to find this, the different gifts in it. Even as many times as I read the gospel reading for today, hearing it anew from Judith, I heard different new gifts in it. I think if we're ready, we can prepare ourselves and ready ourselves to receive the word of God in a different way in this kind of worship in our small group gatherings, in our conversation. Our story from Acts today, too, 
this conversion, the new life that people found from Peter's words, that was from words. They didn't have a church to be in. They didn't have communion. They didn't have any of the things that they were accustomed to. It was just in their conversation and listening to the sacred story made new and accepting the presence of the Holy Spirit among them that change happened. And I wonder too, if we might invite Jesus to stay with us at our tables right now. Even if our tables are at home and they're like mine, somewhat messy and covered with stuff that I haven't put away. And sometimes when I sit at it, I'm grumpy and disappointed. Or I wish I could get takeout instead of cooking again. Jesus wants to eat with us and host a banquet of new life wherever we are, whatever state we find ourselves, whatever messiness or difficulty. Jesus wants to be with us in that. And when we are surprised by Jesus in our midst, which I trust that we will be, I hope that we can share those stories with each other as we seek to move forward in our new life together as the people of grace, as worshipers of the risen Christ. Let it be so. Thank <laughs> you.